Welcome, Mama, to the Postpartum Coach Podcast. Finally, a podcast dedicated just to the mental and emotional world of us postpartum women. I am your friend, fellow mama, and postpartum life coach, Lizzie Langston. After intense birth trauma, delivering my first child, and really scary mental health crises following the birth of my second and third baby, I set off on a six-year journey to understand postpartum mental health from the inside out. On this podcast, I bring you as a mom of four and a certified postpartum life coach, the tools you need to avoid mental health crashes, to get out of the postpartum rut, and to embrace a vivacious motherhood that you love from the inside out. Let's get you feeling like yourself again, mama, and welcome to the Postpartum Coach Podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Postpartum Coach Podcast. It's Lizzie, your postpartum life coach. I have been uh, full-time with the kids this summer, and I lined up a few amazing guests to help me through the summer (laughs) with this podcast. And one of them is Kayla. And I'm going to let you say what your last name is. Go for it. Oh, yes. This is a very common thing. So my full name is Kayla (laughs) Matazuski. Matazuski. I love that. I think it's a fun one. It just rolls off the tongue. (laughs) Dr. Kayla, she goes by. So I'm here with Dr. Kayla. She is a founder of, she is the founder of Empowered Physical Therapy, which is her practice, um, and is dedicated to improving women's pelvic floor health. She graduated from University of Rhode Island in 2016 and developed a passion for pelvic floor physical therapy after experiencing her own issues with leaking during heavy weightlifting. And so this inspired her to create a practice that addresses the disparities in women's health. And Dr. Kayla specifically specializes in helping women through the various stages of life, including pregnancy, postpartum, perimenopause, and menopause by combining her expertise in pelvic floor therapy with a strong orthopedic background and a love for strength training and nutrition. So tell me what orthopedic means, because that's like one of those big words that I think I know what it means, but can you tell me what that one is? (laughs) Absolutely. So that's kind of the standard physical therapy most people think of. So like if you sprain your ankle or if you hurt your back, so anything that has to do with the the musculoskeletal system or injuries that are involved with that. Okay. So that's like an musculoskeletal. Got it. <laughs> so her holistic approach ensures comprehensive care for all her patients. And um, I love this part of her bio. She, Dr. Kayla says when she's not working, she enjoys the gym coffee and playing with her border collie, Ella, traveling and spending time with friends and family. Um, And I personally am so happy to have the energy of a woman who does not have children and who does have a dog and gets a little bit more, maybe, I mean, more freedom. There's pros and cons with every choice in our life, every lifestyle. But I have a sister-in-law who has dogs and they've chosen not to have kids. And like, I always just love going to her house. I love being around her. So thank you for bringing some of that maiden sovereign energy here today on the Postpartum Coach Podcast. (laughs) Hey, I thank you so much. What a beautiful introduction. I really appreciate being here with you. Yes. So, I mean, obviously in your bio here, it says that you were um, leaking, pee-pee, if anyone's wondering, (laughs) during during heavy weightlifting, incontinence is like a fancy word. Um, I personally just had my fourth baby, including an emergency C-section about a year ago. And just this morning, I was like laughing at something that I said, because I do that a lot. I laugh at my own jokes and stuff. (laughs) But like, I was also kind of hopping on the bed when I said it and it was like, (laughs) Um, and often I just am really open about it. I'll just tell my kids like, oh, you made me laugh so hard. I peed. (laughs) Like they all know mom sometimes pees, (laughs) Um, but this is new for me. So I am going to be 35 this year and it's not been like a pleasant, fun, happy part, but I have decided to laugh about it. Um, But I guess Uh, I would love to just hear some of your unique philosophies, like from your heart, right? You uh, became a doctor, like you have done a lot of schooling now. You've been doing this for years. You have a practice. Obviously, you're dedicated. You're passionate. I remember when you reached out to me to be on the podcast, I could just feel the passion and the love to help women. And so could you please, with some encouragement and some education, like, where do we even begin with all of this? And what are you seeing among postpartum women and moms who have had kids? Like, and not just the physical, but also the emotional and the toll that it takes on their identity and like the embarrassment, just like whatever you want to share. 
Mm, gosh, I love that. That's such a loaded like question. There's a lot. There's a lot. We'll take it piece by piece for sure. Yeah. So I think the passion I have for helping women is we've been so neglected in the healthcare system because, you know, when research was done in medical systems, it's like they used men mostly yeah. and then they treat women as small men. And now they're finally realizing like, we can't do that. Like we're not getting good outcomes. Women aren't being treated how they should be. Yes. Um, now they're finally doing more research on women specifically and learning the impacts of the differences in hormones. And that even, you know, as specific as something as weightlifting, the cues we were giving to women weightlifters was the same as men. And so to go back on my story and how, you know, I was taught in college to weightlift and, and train was in the premise of like, as if I were a man. So what it led to was me putting way too much pressure downwards on my pelvic floor and my bladder was leaking a little bit because my pelvic floor, like no matter how hard it was working, couldn't combat the pressure I was putting down because that's how we were taught to brace our core during a heavy lift. So yeah, that can translate over to women who have had kids who their pelvic floor for nine months is getting overworked. Like you're yeah. holding up organs, but now you're holding up this baby. Yeah. In your room and your your pelvic floor can't keep up with that. Yeah. So you need to be able to teach women that, you know, you need to properly be able to engage your core and not put downward pressure on that weakened area so that you can avoid issues like leaking, um, like what you said, you know, pee pee but when you're playing on the bed. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, it's great to, to have humor around it. And I love that you are open about that with your children. And I think what society has done is, yes, we've created humor around it, which is fine, but we've also kind of normalized it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas it's not, it doesn't have to be a normal thing. Like, right. Our, do and intervene either during pregnancy, which is the preferred thing from our standpoint, is get in and do prehab um, or after. And there's so many things that we can implement to help women with these these issues that, and, and for some people, is really sensitive to talk about. Yeah. Uh, and the other, you know, the part that like pregnant women and postpartum women go through is they're treated really well by doctors during the pregnancy. Oh, mm-hmm baby our high priority we want to make sure everything's perfect we want to make sure your labor and delivery is perfect but as soon as you have that baby in your hand it's like mm, all right have six fun. week checkup and that's it yeah yeah it's and on it's you to reach out for help and so much of the nuanced services that we really want that i mean are out of pocket or are not completely covered it is mind-boggling like the system has failed f <laughs> maybe a d <laughs> It's been failing us since the dawn of time, right? Like, like I said, just only researching men, and now it's like, okay, it's just yeah, three. They would immediately refer you to physical therapy, but oh, you just had a C-section, and now you have to take care of three older children and a new baby, and your abdominal just got cut through skin, fat, fascia, muscle, uterus. Oh no, just go home and 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 pick up and where you left off. Like oh. Have fun. You know, I actually feel rage and anger right now as you say that because um, I'd never looked at it from that perspective when you compare to surgery. You know, like if you have a surgery, they're like, oh, and it comes with six weeks of coverage for physical therapy because it's a surgery. And then, but when it comes to an, a cesarean, um, I am not aware of any kind of coverage. Nobody has told me about that. And um, it's been really hard because I am... Full. My hands are full. My hands are full with a baby. Uh, I still have my business. I've got supporting my husband and I've got three older kids, including a kid on the spectrum. So for me, I really would love to get all of my, because it's not just the pee thing. So then you've got my orgasm feels different. Like maybe like one or two feel great and normal, but I notice that like the duration and the intensity of my pleasure has like also tapered. And I hear that that's regular. Also, there's like embarrassing, like looseness in some of those muscles sometimes. And it's just, it's infuriating to think that I chose to open my body to have a baby, to give life, which contributes to society. And I am not taking care of um, for that. 
and uh, n- mental health. Don't get me started. Obviously, that ball has been dropped, but even the physical. So, yeah. So, mm-hmm. do you have any comments on that? Absolutely. So I'm really, I admire you being open about that because I feel like the more that we talk about those things, the more women hear about these things, they're not going to feel as alone. So yeah. I really appreciate you for just jumping right into saying something like that yeah. and then talking about yourself and relating to other people. So if we want to talk about the physiology of an orgasm, the yeah. the comes to mind from a physical therapy perspective is basically what an orgasm is, is a really strong pelvic floor contraction with all that blood flow coming in and the nervous system being fed by, you know, the appropriate amount of blood. So if you just went and had, you know, a pregnancy and delivery, whether it be cesarean or uh, vaginal delivery, your pelvic floor is still impacted. Yes. Uh, and now, you know, you're weakened in that area and nobody's helping you. Your your sexual function and your orgasm are going to be impacted. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's a way we connect with our partner. It's yeah. a way, you know, it's part of being a human and having a beautiful yeah. relationship with your partner. And if you feel almost like you're, I don't want to use this terminology, but if you feel like you're almost broken because of it, like you can't have that orgasm and you can't have that experience anymore, it's going to take away from your relationship and, and then up yeah. back and you know well and it yeah and it starts exactly it's a cascade because what it does is it starts this um you're good it what it does is it starts this dialogue of self-pity and um and because we don't have somebody else's voice in our head like you today are an advocate for women but because we're not with that all the time we tend to and I tend to just be like down on myself. I'm like, oh, I still haven't gotten to take, gone to, to get that taken care of. Or, oh, it's so frustrating because like I don't have a ton of time and extra time and I got to go find a physical therapist and then it's going to be out of pocket. And then I'm going to have to drive probably to their practice. And then there's the whole embarrassing situation of like telling them all the things I'm experiencing. And hopefully I would find a practice that has women who are super great and understanding, but you know, it's kind of like when you go to the OB and you got to like open your legs to any stranger. It's just like, oh, this is great. <laughs> so anyway, I really appreciate the compassion that you bring um, and the the reminder that this really um, is something that systemically shouldn't have been left to you to deal with and that you should have been aided and supported through this. And it's not even um, discussed and stuff like that. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. I mean, honestly, that's kind of why myself and my partner started this business is because we felt like it just, the community one is, is not receiving the education about this or being taught or like informed about any of these things. Yeah. you have a bigger presence on social media so that we can disseminate more information and let women know that they don't have to live with certain things and there are options. Um, so yeah, we kind of went off on our own to be able to do those kind of things. Yeah. And also, you know, we understand that busy moms sometimes can't drive and find a physical therapist um, because they are busy with their their home life or working. And it's the other thing women these days are are, are pushed into doing is like juggling so many things, like mm-hmm. have a successful career, like be a good mom, like be a good wife, make sure the house is good. Oh, get your body back to how it should be. It's like, oh my God, how do you juggle all that stuff? Mm-hmm. Um, so we also offer like virtual services so that, you know, if there's something you want to address, we can talk through it, look at you on video, uh, see how you're moving and you can do it from your home, um, which also can be more valuable in some senses because you want to function in your home. So if we can see you functioning in your home, then we can actually get better information than if you came to a clinic and we just kind of arbitrarily watched you do what you're doing, but in your home, you're going to be moving differently and acting differently. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we completely understand that at Empowered Physical Therapy and we want to be able to offer as much as we can to support women in all, like I said, all journeys of their life. Because the thing is like, we change so much through our life and we get educated in fourth grade with like the books from the eighties about puberty and what to expect and all those changes. And Mm -hmm. then so you get pregnant for the first time and they try to tell you how your body's going to change, but you're not fully prepared. Yeah. And then 
the process of labor and delivery is like this full mind blowing experience and the hormones that change and yeah. Uh, yeah, forget menopause. Like we don't have enough information about that and how to support women as they change another time. Like you're never yeah. never fully yourself as a woman. You're just completely changing through these different points in your life. And the like I think what you talk a lot about is like the mental and emotional health around that is it's so important to be prepared for changes and being okay with changes. And then like yeah. those yeah. changes. Yeah. And I remember in my, cause I had my first three kids from ages 24 to about uh, 28 or nine, 28. And so I had three kids in four years and um, never an ounce of issue with pelvic floor. And then I waited about six years and had got pregnant with my fourth and final Ren. And um, totally different ball game. So I know there are moms out there that are having babies in their 30s or maybe even early 40s. And and um, I just don't want women who are older who are... And some some women who are younger are also having incontinence or other issues with pelvic floor because every labor, pregnancy, and delivery is so different. Um, but I, I kind of... Anyway, to wrap up what I was saying is I, I want to just shout out to the moms whoever, however old you are and however many babies you have or haven't had um, who are struggling, just remember that like you are just as worthy and you don't need to be embarrassed that this is wrong with you. Um, it like, or not, I don't think that's the right language that it's wrong with you, but that your body, your body just needs support. She's talking to you. And I just love the idea of like, that's how we want it. It's actually really great that our body is talking to us um, because then we can work with her to do something about it. Yeah, that's incredible. I know if we we just tune into what we're being told and don't let medical professionals gaslight you, like you know your body and it's like you need to advocate for what you're feeling and what it's telling you, like what you said. And I think also, you know, you said you're 35 and you just had your last baby a year ago. Um, there's women having babies at 42 yeah. now. Like, to me, like as someone who doesn't have a child yet, like I do have ambition of eventually having children. Mm -hmm. It's like there was a fear of like, oh, I'm 33. I'm getting up in that age where it's like, whoa, maybe I should have them soon. Or like there's this fear, of, like if I don't have them soon, like I won't be able to have them. But luckily, we're learning so much more about how to be safer later in life having children. Yeah. Uh, and so that's another area where we can support the the women who are a little bit older because your body is changing. Like your muscle, yeah. it is muscles on. Because at age 30, your bone and your muscle do naturally start to um start to not deteriorate, like weaken, maybe or yeah, 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 yeah. And so to keep up with that is harder as we get older, but you can do it and you slow down that regress, that progression of, of weakening, but it inevitably does happen. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're saying your, your, your most recent um, delivery resulted in more issues is not surprising because yeah, he and aging, but there is support, which is beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So let's, I have a couple questions because I've, you know, I've talked with people about pelvic floor health here and there and, I, I like getting a lot of different angles. One of my question is, are you aware of um, like at different parts of a woman's cycle when her hormones are shifting, does that in fact impact the um, quality of, of her pelvic floor or how strong it can be? I'm just curious if you know anything about that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That is actually an area that I am starting to dive more into because there are there is more research about the impact of specific hormone levels and the muscles. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in the beginning, you have the follicular phase, like right after you menstruate and you move into ovulation. That's when women are at their like best. Um, right. They're more confident. They're stronger. Their muscles are more viable. And then more energy. Yeah. Yes. And then as we move into luteal phase, that's when women get a little more sluggish and the muscles actually can be impacted during that time as we lose the estrogen and progesterone as we're moving into menstruating again. It's kind of like thinking about what happens in menopause. So in menopause, that's when the estrogen and progesterone are much lower. You know, we're kind of losing that. Um, 
beautiful protective uh, estrogen. So it's a very small window of time for a menstruating woman that the luteal phase into menstruating is probably a time when you might notice that you can't control things as much from a pelvic floor. Interesting. Muscle. Okay. Um, that makes so, sense. Yeah. I don't know. And I, I asked that because I've heard of people being prescribed hormones as a treatment for pelvic floor prolapse issues. Obviously, there's various degrees of prolapse. And so, you know, hormones aren't probably going to help everything. Sometimes even surgery is needed. Um, but that's why I asked that is because I was curious about, okay, so if hormones are helping some women with their maybe light issues in their pelvic floor, maybe there's a relationship there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, kind of piggybacking into the menopause there, there's luckily more research saying like we should be doing hormone replacement therapy for women as they move into menopause. Um, and that the, the research at one point said, you know, extra hormones at that time and could impact like breast cancer. And, um, I think also uterine, cervical, ovarian cancer, like the female structures, it can increase your risk, but they're showing that it's not actually now. So mm -hmm. hormone replacement therapy for women moving into menopause is actually showing to be very beneficial. Yeah. And Okay. So that's cool. And you guys, a couple, um, for those who haven't maybe listened to it, a couple episodes back, I interviewed Dr. Jen White and we talked a lot about hormones. So if you do have specific hormone questions, you guys can go check out that episode. Cool. So um, how do you know? Well, like, okay, maybe let's just go over what are some of the common things postpartum that are going wrong or even during pregnancy that are making women feel uncomfortable, causing some issues. Um, so what is happening? And then I also want to talk about um, why it's best to get treat, treat, treated or help um, during pregnancy. Ideally, obviously for me, that's not, it's not going to be possible because I'm already been like a year but um i want to know why that is um so let yeah if we could just go over what what are the things that are even happening for those who haven't had them happen yet they can be looking out for those things and then for those who might be experiencing them they can, they can at least have some language around them let's yeah i would love to hear that well yeah so i mean obviously the body changes quite a bit as we move through pregnancy um, things have to stretch and expand and make room for the baby. And that is the priority. Like the body is going to prioritize the safety of the baby in the growing uterus. So um, the big things that come to mind are we have a natural low back curvature. That curvature, as you start to expand into the second and third trimester in your belly, that curvature actually moves up the spine. So your hinge point goes up higher, which can cause some more discomfort because that area is not supposed to be where the hinging happens, but it naturally goes up higher. Okay. So with will complain of discomfort in that area. The other thing that happens at that higher hinge point is the rib cage is expanding so much to allow for that baby to grow up into the rib cage. Um, you might notice, you know, your bra strap gets really, like you need a bigger bra strap number. Um, and so what that does is change the breathing mechanics, right? Mm, okay. Rib cage isn't moving in and out because, you know, there's no space for one, but two, what happens is after you deliver the baby, that rib cage actually stays open unless we address it. Um, the abdominals in the front obviously separate and grow and expand because the belly is growing and expanding. And when the muscles are just at their biggest length, they can't contract as well. So women are losing the core stability. Potential. Yes, that's me. Yep. As you, you grow a belly in the front, um, and then underneath, you know, the pelvic floor, like I said earlier is, is being challenged with extra weight and pressure. Um, so it kind of weakens a little bit, but what we can do during pregnancy is we can actually work on all of those areas to mitigate as much as we can, like those things are going to naturally happen, but we can keep them strong in the range of motion that they have. Okay. Uh, and the other part of it is, is like knowing how your, your center of gravity changes as you have the belly, you know, expanding in the front is we can talk about that and, and come up with ways to improve your posturing mm -hmm. uh, and use belly, um, belly support, um, SI joint belts. So different tools, external tools, not only like using your muscles as an, as an internal tool, but also these external supports are really valuable 
um, to reduce pain Mm -hmm. and, and those changes that come along with it. I wish I would have, I wish I would have sought out support for that because just, I just, even still, I struggle with posture. My body just got like warped in some different ways and it just didn't bounce back the same way it did in my twenties. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think some of that is, I do think my hormone levels, I'm going to get them checked with, with Dr. Jen. Cause I do think they are lower. So I do wonder if that plays a role in it. But I also just think like I had three kids I was walking around helping when the other and they were they're like older kids and I'm driving a lot and sitting and anyway. So yeah. Absolutely. I'm like anybody can go in while you're pregnant and be preventative. That would be ideal. You guys should, totally should, especially if this isn't your first baby. Yeah. And the other thing they're saying is like, don't change your exercise regimen. They're saying it's safe to continue whatever you were doing before during your pregnancy. So for instance, as as a weightlifter, if I were to be pregnant, they would recommend that I keep doing that strength training because my body knows and can do that. I mean, you adapt a little bit as your as your belly gets in the way. You can't be doing certain lifts or moves and you want to protect your back and core, but keep doing what you were doing before. Like if you were a runner, it's still safe to be a runner um, with just some some modifications as your body changes. But the other like contrasting part of that is, is if you were sedentary <laughs> as a person and now you're pregnant, we actually want to get you into an exercise regimen. Because if you're starting at this lower level as a sedentary person and your body is going to be changing and adapting you know, doing what you were doing before actually doesn't apply to you. We actually want you doing a little more, like Got keeping it. up with your aerobic capacity and 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 gaining strength in different areas. So um that that verbiage I just used is 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 only applicable to people who were exercising before. Got it. Got it. Uh, yeah. And that's where we can jump in too. Like if someone's afraid like fear is a big thing. Like, oh, I wasn't exercising before. Like, how do I exercise while I'm pregnant? Like, I don't know. And that's really common. And that's something that we can do as physical therapists Mm -hmm. to set up to be that person. Yeah. It Um, sounds like your practice, um, empowered physical therapy, it sounds like you guys definitely have, I, I just, I think this would be useful to the audience, a specialty in women who are wanting to strength train or who were already doing that and are very focused or even just mildly focused on being able to bring that back to themselves postpartum as soon as possible. Um, If you have specific weight goals or if you're a bodybuilder, I feel like you guys would be an extra good fit. It's not like you can't help others or anything. It's just like, I just feel like that is a piece of where the passion is for you guys. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for for recognizing that. I, I feel good that that's coming through. Yeah. That's totally like we just women need to be strong. Like we need muscles. We need to be empowered to feel like we can, you know, be that type of body and like muscles are beautiful now. Like I think at one point people were afraid to be the bulky or it would be masculine or it's like, no, now we're seeing like there's some huge health benefits to having more muscle mass on a female. Uh-huh. I would love to hear about a couple of those if you don't mind sharing. I've heard that there are uh, benefits to having muscle. And oh. like, I think, doesn't it help your bone health or, mm-hmm. or, and you're less likely to develop certain something, something, somethings? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So osteoporosis and yeah. osteoporosis. Yeah, that's what you're talking about with the bone degeneration. So again, naturally at 30, you start to degenerate in the bones. Um, And the more you have, or the more you use a muscle where it attaches on a bone, it forces your nervous system to be like, oh my God, this muscle keeps pulling on this bone. We need to build up that bone because the body is asking for it to be stronger in that area. Got it resistant, heavy resistance training, and that muscle keeps pulling on that bone area, the nervous system's like, okay, bring in more calcium and all the the beautiful bone building stuff to make that stronger there. Got it. That's one way. Um, And then if you want to go into hormones, estrogen helps with that, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother. But from a muscular skeletal perspective, that's how it helps with the strong bones. Mm -hmm. And then just having more muscle mass on your body, your muscle is what burns your energy, right? So if you're someone who wants to lose weight or fat, like let's not say weight because muscle weighs more than fat. But if you're someone who wants to get rid of some fat on your body, the more muscle you have, the more it's going to burn the calories and the energy. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. So that's um, a good 
another reason why having more muscle is beneficial. Um, and then thinking about women in menopause, there's new research saying that the more muscle, actually, the yeah, the more muscle and the more you do resistance training, the less menopausal symptoms you'll have. I think the number is less. So people- 40% have- less. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, the exact study was they took women who hadn't done resistance training, they're in menopause, they're having symptoms. And they did eight weeks of consistent resistance training. I think it was like three times a week. And they reported 40% less symptoms in menopause. Um, Fascinating. Yeah. And so the, and the other thing is like the younger we can get women lifting and the more they build up their body, that natural decline that we have later in life, you're going to have less decline. Because if you start, you know, here or here and you both are going to steadily decline, guess who ends up at a better place than the other person? Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, starting at a higher higher muscle mass and bone mass is going to set you up better for later in life. And also, like, people ask me, like, Kayla, what are you training for? I'm like, well, I just want to be a strong old lady. (laughs) Yeah. I want to, like, get up out of the chair when I'm 90 if I make it that long, you know? So yeah, we're having a, a more quality of life later in life. Yeah. You know, I am just not a big fan of the gym. I, there's something about the culture there. I think there's a lot of like sexualization of people. Like not really me, but I just, sometimes I feel like everybody's just checking each other out. And maybe it's just the younger people. I don't know. But do you have any ideas for those of us who are not exactly gym people, um, ways to, you know, whether it's in daily life or like classes or I don't know, ways that you see working for people like that to to build muscle. Absolutely. We get that a lot. Yeah. The gym is a really intimidating place for a lot of people, especially women. And, you know, for reasons and, you... Yeah. Well, and also if you're going to be using the machinery and you've never done it before and there's no one to like walk you through it and you don't want to be that person, because that was me. Gratefully, I was there with my husband and he was super sweet. But like, if he hadn't been there, I would have literally just gone home and like, well, that's never happening again. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We don't want people like feeling their nervous system getting like all fight or flight. Activated. Yeah. Because yeah, they're in the gym. So no, there's plenty of other options. Like honestly, body weight exercises can be really beneficial. Meaning um, what does you mean? Like, like push, air, push-ups, for example. Push-ups. Um, I mean pull-ups you don't have to do squats that. yep squats um lunges okay. uh calf raises yeah so then you can just tweak it to be more repetitions okay. because hypertrophy training or making more bulky muscle or adding more muscle fibers to the muscle hypertrophy is the word we use the number of repetitions for that is typically between 12 and 15 reps. So if we can get you to a point where you're working in that kind of rep range, um, you can build muscle. It does kind of uh, toggle the line of being endurance training, but um, endurance training meaning like sustaining an activity for a duration. Like but motherhood it, every day, basically. <laughs> it's very endurance <laughs> focused. Good point. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> And then, you know, you can buy some really simple equipment like exercise bands, like that can add resistance, um, light weights, or you can make weights. Like I've had people take gallon milk jugs and just fill them up with water and like, oh, now you have some weights that you can use. So you can be resourceful in that way. Um, the biggest thing is with home exercise or like things doing at home is you want to find ways to make it harder. Like as you're getting to a point where you can do 15 repetitions, no problem. Like we want it to be hard by the last three reps. You want to be like, Ooh, I'm barely getting those last three reps. And that's when you know you're at the right level of Um, challenge. Okay. Yep. So once you're at that point, it's like, okay, now we need to add resistance. So let's be creative and figure out how to do that so that you don't have to go to a gym. Like if you're not in, I'm not ready. You don't have the time. Like, yeah, or up to, to simulate resistance training. Mm-hmm. Okay. I guess one of my final questions here is, um, what are the things women should be like looking out for if they've never ever experienced pelvic floor, um, whether it's incontinence or any sort of issues? Um, what what is it that maybe they would notice for the first time that would be happening that would be a little flag? Like, okay, I maybe need to book a, a call with a physical therapist that specializes in the pelvic floor, et cetera. 
Mm, I love that question. So the first one that comes to mind is like back pain that's not improving with traditional physical therapy or other interventions because the core system is all linked. The pelvic floor is the bottom of your core. And if there's dysfunction in the bottom, it could be translating to your back, your hip, your SI joints in the back. Because they're going to be overcompensating. Mm, Yep. Yep. Because if your pelvic floor is not doing its job, the other areas are going to try and jump in and help. Um, I think I actually am experiencing that. My massage therapist was saying, um, your hips are so tight and then my back hurts. And actually my feet have been killing me, which I don't know. Yeah. Ooh, that's interesting. A fun fact real quick. The muscles in your calf are on the same nerve that stimulates the pelvic floor. Okay. So interesting. Curious if there's a connection there. <laughs> oh, I'm sure positive. So I'll you probably be hearing from me here soon. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Um, some other signs are are more the classic ones, like if you have leaking or incontinence, um, not able to hold your gas, like if you feel like, you know, you're trying really hard or like if you have an urge that you can't suppress, um, some other ones might be sexual dysfunction, like, oh my God, my orgasm is not as good as it used to be. Yeah. Um, feeling like heaviness in your pelvis, like there could be some bulging of the organs coming into the vaginal canal. No, I actually, yes. I'm like, yes, that one was creepy to me because I've never, so like if you sit down to pee and you feel up into your vaginal canal and there's stuff in there that's not usually there, like that is, I learned that's kind of like the beginning stages or it depend. I mean, I guess it could be past beginning, but that's what prolapse is, is when things that are supposed to be a nice long tunnel are kind of like, like folding yeah. down. And um, yeah, that one was fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Yep. Another one. And that can like- change. I got to add to that. That can actually change when your partner penetrates you. Like that can actually really change the way it feels. Or not, not really exactly for the better. And so anyway, all of this is less about like black and white, broken and fixed and more about like a slow decline of quality. And a slow, gradual overcompensating, a slow, gradual buildup of pain. And I'm literally saying this because it's been like, you know, 13 months since I had my baby. And I'm at a point now where I'm like, okay, this is like annoying enough that I'm probably going to take care of it. And it's so sad that it gets, that's the decision-making thing because the system is just like so unhelpful, (laughs) but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the other things too, is women will have a baby and then they might not have any symptoms right after, and they might not have any symptoms six months, nine months, or a year later, but then all of a sudden, Mm -hmm. like you said, these slow compensations that you didn't realize you were doing all added up. And now you're like, oh my gosh, why is this happening now? I was fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or if you have other factors that are um, creating a decline in your hormones, whether it's perimenopause or sleep deprivation or a lot of stress or you're eating some something that you actually have an allergy to, I we've figured out that the hormones can also be related to the quality of how your pelvic floor is doing too. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting factors. So how do people um, take the first step like both in your practice at Empowered Physical Therapy, but then in general, like once they find someone they want to work with, what's what's it typically like, that whole process? Yeah, absolutely. So it kind of depends what the situation is. So if you're going to an insurance-based practice, which is a whole another topic, like we need another day for a podcast to talk about that. But if you're doing an insurance-based practice, you will need a referral from your doctor, which can be hard. Like if the doctor doesn't believe that you need physical therapy, you might be fighting a little battle with them, which is really sad that that is something, but strongly... Like a gatekeeper, they're a gatekeeper, yeah. Uh, so you'll need a referral and then they'll send it to the pelvic floor physical therapist and then they'll call you. So it's a whole waiting game. And oftentimes, because there aren't as many pelvic floor physical therapy um, specialists that compared to like a regular general physical therapist, the wait is long. Okay. Uh, Planning ahead is kind of helpful. So if you are pregnant right now, it might behoove you to actually try to to speed up that process. Get on a list maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Be like, hey, I know like I'm going to have my baby in August. I want to get into physical therapy by the middle of September. Like just being proactive in that way is really helpful. Um, 
But if you're going to a cash-based physical therapist, you can just research them and go straight to them. So physical therapy, luckily in the United States, is now direct access, which means you can go right to a PT. However, your insurance company might not reimburse or pay for it. So right. you might be making an investment into your health on your own. Yeah. Uh, so those those are the two main ways that it happens. Yeah. Okay. So, are, is it ever too early after you've had baby, right? Like, do you do you guys prefer that they wait at least X amount of weeks or months before they even mess with any sort of ther- physical therapy? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously your healthcare practitioner who's following you, wife, uh, doctor, whoever you're using for your birthing care, um, we would like to hear a little bit of um, clarif- clarification from them about where you're at and what you can do. However, we have enough knowledge as doctors of physical therapy to make a, an accurate like judgment call on what you can handle. And honestly, what I start almost everyone with is breathing. So right after really, birth, like, yeah, a couple of days after, we can teach you how to correctly breathe and just gently get your core and your pelvic floor firing again more correctly. Oh, cool! I love that. Okay. Well, I can do that. <laughs> like, can I just start there? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's so foundational, like getting those ribs to move back in and like getting your deep core to to pull in because breathing, pelvic floor, deep core, they work together. Yeah. Okay. And then I guess one quick little thing I want to sneak in, diastasis recti or diastasis recti. Do you guys help with that? Oh, yes. That's a big one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So do you just, what do you like? What's an example of like one way that you approach that? I'm just so curious. Yeah. So honestly, the first one is breath because like I said, the the diaphragm, the the deep transverse abdominis, the deep core muscle and the pelvic floor are all connected. So if we can get you firing that system correctly, uh, gently through breath, that's where we start. And then we work on pressure management. So if you can't you know, like if you're bearing down or like if you can't manage the pressure in your core, you're going to be pushing outwards on this already weakened diastasis recti area. So we work on pressure management, making sure that you're not, you know, pushing outwards and then teaching different techniques for lifting and getting out of bed and not overusing that area because you want it to come back together and heal. Okay. Uh, and then eventually, because of the separation in the top abdominal muscle, eventually we start incorporating like really easy crunches just to see if we can get the, the rectus abdominis to like fire and come back together. But we also can do lots of manual techniques because in pregnancy, you know, your your belly is in front of you and creating the shift in, in forward weight, your back tightens up and has to resist that so that you can yeah. stay back. So p- women often their backs get really, really tight, and if yep. you can't get the the muscles and the fascia in the back to stretch, it's just going to be pulling your abs in the front backwards, and that's going to create more of that separation in the front. So oh, okay, so you got to loosen out your back, your low back, yeah. and that will help give some some yeah. extra slack, I guess, to your abs to help them move back to the center Thank instead you. of being stretched apart. Exactly. So it's so logical, but it's just a a whole other world that most people don't even hear about until they're having issues. So thank you so much for your time and for your generous expertise. Where can people find you guys and what kinds of ways do you work with people? I know you said you have virtual appointments. Where are you guys based out of? And then do you have like an online program or how do you do that? Yeah, great question. So we are in Brattleboro, Vermont. It's a small rural town. Um, we You can find it on empoweredphysicaltherapy.org. We do have a contact form you can fill out and just tell us about yourself and what you're dealing with. And then we reach out to you. Um, I'm very open about giving my cell phone number out and my okay. email. So that's an easy way to reach me too. Um, I do a lot of the the communicating with people. So it feels more personal and okay. and. Yeah. We also have social media. Um, Instagram is empowered underscore physical underscore therapy. Um, And then Facebook, we also have a group that many people join and just be part of a community. And we put information in there weekly or almost daily about different health topics, all the way from nutrition to sleep quality to stress management. Yeah. Okay. That sounds amazing. I just, I already feel relief just knowing that you guys are out there and that you are so kind and so friendly and so non judgmental. 
And I really love your philosophy of that women need to be strong. I totally agree. And it's starting to put in perspective for me. Um, not only do I not feel strong, but I also feel like in a lot of pain. And I think like even just having this conversation has helped me shift to really being present with that. And it's not, it's not that I'm like lazy or something. It's that we just get into this um taking care of everybody else and survival mode and um when, you know, the time and the whatever. But this makes me excited to think about um how good I could feel. So how long does it typically take for people um, you know, to start to see results and really feel better? Like, you know, a little bit better and then a lot better and then totally healed. What's that like? I know it probably varies, but yeah, yeah, it definitely varies person to person and what they can commit to. Um, but honestly, just like if I teach someone how to stand correctly or like breathe correctly, they're like, whoa, that made a huge difference. You know, these really? little subtleties. That's why virtual care can actually have a lot of benefit. I mean, it does have some limitations because putting our hands on people is is important, but there's so much in the education, like you kind of just alluded to, that you can take away and start working on. So I feel like a lot of people feel pretty pretty positive about the prognosis for them. And that alone, just feeling positive and, and like there's something they can do and be in control of is, is energizing. So yeah. Too. Yeah. So if people pay out of pocket, do you guys do like packages to help incentivize them to come a few times and get the help they need? Exactly. Cool. Yeah. Because if you come once, like, yeah, you're going to get a little information, but like, if you're going to put in an investment and in, you might as well go the whole, the whole thing and just, you know. Yeah. 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 So is it like a minimum of six sessions or anything like that? Yeah. So our smallest package is a six visit package. And then we have a 10 and a, a, a three month. So okay. if you do a three month thing, it's like you get a visit every single week. Um, and then if at the end of three months, we're not quite there, or if you want to continue on, or if you want to progress something or even work on something different, like I said, we kind of do orthopedic care. So if you came, you know, halfway through and like, Ooh, I really tweaked my neck. It's like, all right, well, let's work on your neck. Like, that's totally fine. Yeah. We like add, um, a whole nother month or two months or whatever. Like mm -hmm. we're here to help. We basically work for the client, the patient, right. Know? Them to be in control of their care and just be the facilitators, the guidance. Yeah. And that's beautiful. I could really see you guys just like, like if I could, I feel like if I started crying or was just like overwhelmed or whatever, I feel like you guys would be like, we see you. <laughs> Absolutely. And I've had an entire session with someone where it was more of a mental health, emotional support, like coaching vibe, which I think you can really appreciate. Yeah. Uh, and that felt valuable to them. Like that's what they mm -hmm. needed to say. And it didn't yep. happen any kind of pressure to like do physical stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's where the holistic, like whole body, whole person approach that we take comes in. I love that. Well, thank you, Dr. Kayla. That's that's Dr. Kayla from Empowered Physical Therapy. They're in Virginia. What was the cute little city you said? Right over Vermont. Oh, Vermont. Sorry, I said Virginia. I meant Vermont literally in my head. Okay. Because the two beats. About, it's the only Brattleboro in the whole country. Brattleboro. That's so cute because in London, like in England, it's like a ton of boroughs. So you got like a little oh. borough. That's yeah. great. Rattaboro, Vermont, mm -hmm. not Virginia. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you again. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. And I hope some of you guys like reach out, you know, maybe you just even join their Facebook group. Um, but stay on top of it, you 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 lovelies, because you don't want to have to deal with it later like I am. <laughs> when not only have you suffered and now my hips and my back are super tight and then I've, you know, had like embarrassing where I got to go change my pants because I just peed. But also, um, then you don't have to deal with it and you can just like, and, and also it's the schedule, right? The more kids you have, the more of an inconvenience it feels to need to go do these things. But also I'm very grateful for my body that I she can like be like, hey, don't forget about me. And I'm going to listen to her and take care of her. So thanks again, Dr. Kayla. Um, you guys, everything that you need to reach them will be in the show notes. And so um, we'll see you soon. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Hey, Lizzie here. I've helped dozens of postpartum moms just like you to manage their postpartum anxiety and deconstruct their postpartum depression. It's really easy for me. So if you're ready to feel better, I know the way. Let's chat on the phone. Set up a time by going to lizzylangston.com 
gmail.com forward slash consult. It's pretty simple. And I will be calling you soon. 